Hello, golf fans. Welcome back to another episode of the Daily Fantasy Golf Preview for the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Joining me, as always, is Dane Schnow. How's it going tonight? I'm good, Chris. How are you? Going pretty good. Glad to be back. Uh, thanks for covering for me there last week. Um, was was away, but I am back. I was able to get some lineups in at least uh, come Wednesday there, and things actually went quite well Like in terms of my... DraftKings skeleton for cash games. It went really well. It was it was no it was a breeze all the way through. Uh, GPP was looking real good in the first three days. Kind of tanked there on Sunday a little bit. Uh, ended up about well, can't, not counting the double ups. I ended up just above even for just GPP only. So it, all in all, it was it was a it was an all right week. I know a uh, sensitive subject bringing up Hovland here, but I know you were a little high on him. So uh, I'm assuming your week maybe didn't go as well. Uh, definitely not. So I, I, I got zero back. I always love those weeks. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's just one of those fr- or Thursday evening. You're um, watching Hovland go up to about plus seven or, or whatever it was, and you have him pretty highly exposed. And it's, it, you know, it's just not going to be a good week. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was definitely tilt worthy. That's for sure. Uh, one and done went. I had Berger in my one and done mm-hmm. last week, and that that went all right. Um, he ended up at the top five, and I ended up sitting after segment one of the GUP contest, sitting top thirty. So overall, it was a pretty good week. As you can probably yeah. see, we are now doing awesome. things a, a little bit different. Um, we are will be recording this as an audio only podcast, like you have seen or heard, I guess you could say, the last couple weeks. But now we're going to be doing uh, video as well. I see Dane's video is locked right now, but I do hear his voice, so that's good. Things are going to be working there. So what we're going to do, we're going to go over, we're going to talk about the course a little bit. We're going to talk about some strategy stuff as well as uh, jump in and talk about uh, maybe our top three plays in each price range and kind of just kind of go off each other that way, some cash plays and some GPP plays. So if you're ready to rock and roll, let's get started. Yep, I'm good. Awesome. So like I said, we are here for the... um, Arnold Palmer Invitational coming from Bay Hill Club and Lodge. Uh, that is in Orlando, Florida. It's a par 72, 7,454 yards. Uh, it's got Bermuda green, so we're back on Bermuda. It's a little bit larger than average. I believe they are around 7,500 square feet on average. Lots of bunkers. There's 84 bunkers in play in this course. Water, not as much water as last week, but still Florida heavy on water. We got, uh, I think it's in play at 9 out of the 18 holes. So we do see those water balls. So there's going to be some disasters here again this week. The one difference in digging into it, um, looking at just comparing the difficulty rankings, last week was top five um, for the Honda Classic. This week, last five years difficulty were 8th, 15th, 9th, 28th, and 36th. So there's been years where it's been, a you know, really i don't want to say easy but it's been an easier course and then like last year it played eighth now with that in mind the winning score last year was still minus 12 and it's reached double digits winning score i believe in like eight of the last nine events here so there's going to be some scoring i'm not going to totally discount birdie or better percentage still going to look at that bogey avoidance though as well Um, guys are going to need to not give so many shots back to the field to stay in it and then the other thing that I've got here, uh, we've got rough in the Bermuda. The rough is Bermuda grass, but it is overseed with rye. It's about three inches tall. It can be fairly gnarly and tough. So something we do see here at this event a lot is some less than driver. Guys going with less than driver off the tee because accuracy can be very important. Um, so that's one thing I'm looking at a little bit. Not so much off the tee, but I'm kind of ranging more towards the approach side of things and correlations that I ran really did prove that over the you know i looked at the last five events and approach was a lot more important than off the tee especially from the the long range so i looked at some things from fantasy national golf club looking at their approach shot distribution it's over fifty thousand approach shot sample size so it's very huge at this event 31.8 percent of all approach shots came from 200 plus yards no, no other distance was over 19%, so that's kind of what I'm focusing on. What do you got on this course? What stats are you looking at this week? Yes, yeah, so, um, first thing is, is it's an in, invitational field, so it's less than, than a full field event, 120 guys. So uh, maybe that leads to taking a little bit more of a shot on uh, some guys because the bigger percentage of, of the 
field is going to make the cut. Um, but like you mentioned, rough roughs up, greens are, are a lot faster uh, than average. Uh, mid to long irons into the greens, like like you said, a, a lot of the approaches are going to be over 200 yards. Got to be a little conservative off the tee. Um, like you said, be positioned off the tee, but it is more of a approach uh, center golf course. Um, par fives are very crucial with four of them, and that's that's where a lot of the, the scoring comes in here. Um, like you mentioned, winning score around the mid teens usually, um, and the cuts usually plus two, plus one, uh, somewhere in there. Um, it's another it's another Florida course that depends on the weather and and the wind to um, be its defense. And, and I think early forecasts show that it is going to be decent uh, wind again so guys are going to have to be able to navigate that along with the water um, as far as, as key stats i tried to keep it pretty simple this week uh, just get the basics get some guys with that are in good form uh, leading in uh, strokes game ball striking approach par five scoring proximity from the 200 plus uh, i threw some strokes gain putting in there along with strokes gain uh, total to get get an all around look at a uh, guy's game. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. I know we talk about it every week, but I really like bringing it up, keeping the model simple. Um, like on my sheet alone, um, I'm just looking at it right now. I'm not going to count all the stats, but there's something like 28 different stats I've got listed on the sheet. You can really just dig yourself a hole trying to put a little bit of weight on this and a little bit of weight on that and a little bit of weight on this stat. And the one thing that I've found this year, especially for consistency in cash games, what I've done is, like you just said, is really narrow that model down. So every week I'm looking at ball striking, like it's always like 25 to 40% of my entire stats model. And then what I try and do with that is really tweak the ball striking, looking at off the tee and approach and decide which one is a little bit more important. So that's some of the correlations that I run. So this week, obviously, I, th- I find that approach is... Um, three or four times more important than off the tee. Uh, a lot of guys are going to be using, you know, like I said, less than driver. So approach becomes a little bit more important. And then obviously par fives are important, like you said. Um, what I find, though, is par fours, which are obviously tougher. Five of them are 450 to 500 yards. So that's where some of that length comes in as well. I think that's a place where if obviously guys are, you know, not losing strokes on the par fours, even if they're playing some of those tough par fours, uh, you know, even par through two or three days, they're going to be gaining strokes on the field. So that's one place that I'm really concentrating on in my model is par four scoring, because I think a lot of the guys are going to be scoring on par fives. And then, of course, like you said, the long irons, definitely tuning that in a little bit. But for the most part, keeping that model nice and simple. And for consistency in terms of cash games, it's really worked out. And then once I get into building the round one, two, three, and four showdown sheets, I start tweaking that model a little bit more, getting rid of some of that safety because place finishing position isn't factored in until round four. And I really start cranking up that birdie or better percentage just because we really need those birdies um, to be able to cash and showdown. So I kind of keep it very simple and then just tweak little tiny things to add depending on the course. So that would be my one suggestion. Um, I know we talk about every week, and I'm kind of long-winded here, but I feel it's very, very important not to get too deep into trying to fit all 28 stats in your model, um, you know, 1% here, 2% here. So, yeah, with that, um, that kind of – the early forecast with the weather, I know you had mentioned, yeah, we're looking at about 12 to 15 miles an hour of wind kind of throughout the week, seeing some gusts, you know, upwards of 20. So it's not going to be insane wind, but it's definitely going to be there. It's definitely going to affect things. So I will look at some guys that have been trending, you know, last 24, last 50 rounds playing in windy conditions. Thursday's the one that stood out to me the most right now, especially for showdowns. Um, it looks like the wind in the morning is actually kind of around that 8 to 10 mile an hour, and then the afternoon it jumps from like 15 to 16. So we could see a little bit of a split there that we can take advantage of. That's something we will definitely cover in the Slack chat leading up to uh, the event on, I believe it locks again, we're looking at like 4 or 5 a.m. on Thursday morning. So we're going to be in chat definitely uh, Wednesday night for a few hours when we post our skeleton lineups and stuff. So well, I mentioned skeleton lines. One thing I wanted to touch on, we had some customer feedback come in and they just kind of wanted us to mention like a hybrid lineup. So 
we every week we you know we talk about cash games we talk about gpps um, we post skeletons, which are three or four players that we really like, and we put into a into a lineup. And then the the members go in and they use our our picks, our articles, our videos, the cheat sheet, and they go and and then they build the lineups themselves. So some of them are asking for more of a hybrid skeleton lineup, and that's really what I try and build every single week uh, for myself. Is I, I will go with a core of four players who I like in all formats. And then, you know, the open spots, whether I use three or four that I post on the skeleton, uh, I really try and leave it open so that you can go to the sheet and you can grab two guys that are maybe labeled green or purple for cash or core. Or you can go grab, you know, guys that are in blue who I think are like boom or bust GPP plays who you can go that way too. So it kind of gives you um, two, two ways to go and I usually play it. I'll go in the three max. I will run my skeleton, my cash skeleton. I'll run it in cash games. I'll run it as one of my lineups in three max one way. And then I'll take that same skeleton and take it the other two guys and kind of fit it and maybe more upside, but a little more risk. Um, so I'll use two different players to fill in that exact same skeleton lineup. And that's kind of how I build multi-entry is I take a core of three or four players. I'll run it. If I'm doing the 20 max, I'll run it 10 times. But with those other two spots, we'll just, you know, mix in two different players every time so i just want to touch on that a little bit so um anything you have to touch on you know in terms of strategy um the way you're building your lineups and stuff every week uh, i think with that you're exactly right and i mentioned it um at the very top of my article it's it's there every week um i find my core and that can be for cash games um and then like you said, mix and match those two or three guys in GPPs. Don't um, you don't have to have all f- under five percent uh, owned plays, and that's that's what I have in my article. Is you don't have to have all guys who are less than ten or less than five percent. You can use your cash core in GPPs as long as, as you're mixing around uh, some lower owned guys, but they don't all have to be under. <laughs> Uh, owned. If, if a guy's 30, 40% owned, sometimes that literally just means they're a really good player. They're grossly underpriced for that one. Yeah. And for me, um, looking at ownership, I know that's another thing that uh, people wanted to hear a little bit more of on the podcast slash video. Um, I mean, we look more into that ownership side of things come Wednesday when a lot of the data's come in. I use Fanshare Sports as well as uh, the Musonomics Fantasy National Golf Club. They both give you projections based on you know the clicks people are making, who people are talking about in articles, videos, podcasts, so on and so forth, and kind of give you a projection then. And I think it's most accurate on Wednesday. But even early in the week, like you said, it's okay. I I'm more fine with a chalky play if it's an elite player or you know someone that's maybe not so much top 10 in salary but someone that's maybe top 10 in the world or has really good form coming in but if it's a player that is high on just due to say he's got really good course history terrible form that's one i start really considering doing the fade when in terms of gpp because he doesn't check all the boxes or someone that's maybe has terrible stats but has decent form uh, terrible course history but for some reason you know, it looks like they're going to be top five, top 10 ownership. That's when I start looking for a pivot. And when I do that, I personally sort by price. I look at the ownership projections and then I try and find someone in that exact same price range. For, this is for GPP, um, who gives me possibly the same upside. It's probably going to end up being more downside. There's that, you know, it's going to be like a roller coaster. The highs are going to be good, but the lows are going to be terrible. The floor is not going to be there, but he's going to be a quarter maybe even half of the ownership, I think you can really leverage yourself that way in GPPs. Um, so that's kind of the way I look at it as well. So I think that uh, I think that was a good discussion leading into our actual picks for the week. And what we're going to do, we're going to go through each price range. So we're going to look at the 10K and up, the 9, the 8s, and then the 7K and below. And we're just going to go uh, leading off and go maybe our top three picks in each price range, go to the other guy in his top three picks in that price range, kind of mentioning whether they're going to be cash, GPP, um, what format. So I'll start things off. Got to go with Rory McIlroy. He's going to be the consensus, probably highest owned guy in GPP. I'm guessing this week, even with the price that's $800 more than Fleetwood, he really checks every single box for me this week. He's got the stats. Um, he can pretty much win every week. So he's got the upside. He's got the form. He's got top fives in all five of his PGA events this so far this year with a win. 
And he's also got course history here as well. He's finished sixth. He won in 2018 and T4 in 2017. And he made the cut uh, T27 in 2016. And his first time here, 2015, he was T11. So he's number one for me. And this is actually, I was telling you before, this is the first week where my personal top three exactly lines up with my model on my sheet that I don't know if that's scary I don't know if that's uh, a good sign but I'm riding it um, so number two is Bryson for me he's coming off some incredible form two tournaments top fives in both of them he's been ball striking really well the tee to green game he's gained a little over 19 strokes tee to green over those last two events he he's got kind of up and down Course history here, T46 last year, T27 in 2016, but sandwiched right in the middle of that is a T2. So he's shown upside here. He's shown a ton of upside lately. So he's number two for me. Um, both of those guys I would use in all formats. I'm not, you know, cash versus GPP. One guy I'm a little concerned with uh, I will use for GPP only is Hideki Matsuyama. He comes in with some good form. Um, T16 or better, T16, T5, and T6 in his last three events. His course history of the last three years, I think the only reason I maybe go away is because I really like Shambo and the fact that Hideki is T33, T49, T45, his last three trips to this event, might have some people going towards Rory or Bryson or even lower, and I think we might be able to get some leverage, some little bit lower ownership. Now, I'm not going to say he's going to be sub-10% owned, but if Rory's, if we guess that Rory's going to say 23, 24%, I think we can get Hideki somewhere in the 15% to 18% range, which is a little bit of leverage there, and I do like it because he does have that upside. So that's my top three in that top range. Um, what are you looking at this week in the top? Yeah, so first for me is obviously Rory. I'm not going to rehash everything you just said. I mean, it's not, it's never, is he a good play? It's can you get up to him? Yeah. Uh, second is, Second for me is Xander Shoffley at, at 10,000 at the very bottom of this range. It's his debut here, which is surprising for me. Um, but it is, it's a course that should fit him very well. Um, he's first in my stat model last 24 rounds, fifth in my overall uh, model. Um, I want to add course history and recent form in there as well. Um, he's second in proximity for the 200-plus the range that, that we're looking at. Great with the long irons. And something that just popped out crazy to me from his uh, – in Mexico, he gained 10.2 strokes on approach. I know we that were was nuts. on him all that all that week. We were on him hoping that putter would turn around, and, and it obviously did a little yeah. bit on Sunday – or Saturday and Sunday. He still lost strokes putting for the week. But 10.2 strokes on approach is insane. Um, third for me is Bryson uh, for – the same reasons you are a good history here um and he's he's kind of found his form after the off season layoff awesome i definitely like that so that kind of covers our 10k and up i'm going to let you lead off the next range because i have a tendency of picking all the plays that you were going to talk about so i'm going to let you lead off this range and then i'll, I'll follow <laughs> so we'll we'll do let's okay yeah, let's let's even group the eight and nine k range together here. There's you know there's not many in that nine k range. So okay. unless you prepared and you've got three in the nine k, but I think we can group those two ranges together. I, I did. I do have three in the nine, but I can definitely group the eight and nine. Um, I like the eights. I'm not huge on this nine k range overall uh, this week. I guess that's I am kind of leaning towards either. Uh, at first glance going up to Rory because I think you can fit him in with some of the value or um, you might even be able to get some of these guys like a Xander and Bryson in the same lineup um, with some of this value you have in the 7K range. Uh, first of all, uh, for me in this 8 and 9K range is Adam Scott. Um, he's in good form, one at Riviera, great iron player, third in my overall model this week. Really, he's, he's a form play for me. Um, he hasn't. He didn't play here last year. He does have a third here back in 2014. Uh, hasn't missed a cut. Uh, so, so he's the top guy for me in the 9K range. And then, really, I, I'll drop down right into the 8K range. Is, is Ty Hatton at the bottom at 8100? Um, he's eighth in my model this week. Hit it really well, tee to green, which was I was a little surprised um, in Mexico for, with his sixth place finish. Um, he's made all three. Uh, cuts in his three events here, including fourth in 2017 on debut. 
Um, really, I think that he ended up about flat uh, on putting in Mexico um, after he started out a little slow, but I was really encouraged by his, his game that week coming off the wrist injury and the really long layoff. Um, third for me is, again, Colin Morikawa at 8,400. I just I can't quit this guy honestly. Um, he's probably a better if you look at his history or this his form this year. He's probably a better cash play really than GPPs uh, with how consistent he's been. He's been fantastic, fantastic tee to green, um, and he is he just seems like he's primed for a breakout. Um, I love that he has some experience here as an amateur in 2018. He made the cut as an amateur, so. More cow, I'm definitely going back to him. Yeah, my my rankings are fairly close. I'm not going to go much more on Hatton. Um, he's definitely number one for me, and this is definitely uh, points per dollar rankings um, because yeah. that 8100 feels very cheap for him, being that he's made the cut here three times, showed upside, like you said, at fourth in 2017. Very surprising coming mm-hmm. off of that wrist injury, but he was solid. Like the tee to green all the way across, even putting was there. So um, definitely with him. I do like Morikawa, like you said. The one thing I was going to mention was cash. You did that, so that's awesome. I We haven't seen his upside yet, um, but he, like you said, he's been extremely solid, and he just right. makes cut after cut after cut. And when he starts winning, I think it's just not going to stop. Very excited about him as well. I'm going up to the 9,500 range, and I'm going with last week's winner, Sung J.M., um, a lot of people tend to fade last week's winner. I, you know, I kind of, I broke down all the players and I, I made a little note here, uh, by paper. I didn't even use the computer this time. I actually made notes by hand and looking at some of the winners, you know, it's been, it's been up and down the week after a guy has won. We have seen some top fives, obviously Brendan Todd's a little bit of an outlier. He won and then he won again and then he finished T4. Um, so we've got that there, but I'm not too concerned just because he's been one of the most consistent players on tour, just stats wise all around, like looking at my model, which this week in my custom model on fantasy national, I put together just the 2020 season. So we're looking at about, I don't know, up to 11 or 12 events for some of these players now, especially Sung Jay, who really doesn't ever take a, a week off. Like dude must not be married whatsoever or have kids or, or anything like that's all he does is golf <laughs> practice golf and golf <laughs> but knew after the win he was coming back out oh job. for sure yeah and he'll just be he'll be fired up again he's number two in my model that's just he's ranked top 10 in strokes gained approach uh, this is just to the players in this field and just for this season sixth in par four scoring 10th and birdie or better second in that long uh proximity from 200 plus that's been huge that's huge for me and then kind of looking at his trends over the last 24 rounds of strokes gained putting on bermuda he's top 10 there as well i just i can't get off him right now um so i'm definitely be going with him at 9500 because i like you you had mentioned going up Stars and scrubs should be fairly easy. No, I'm not going to say easy, but it's definitely viable again this week. You can get Rory, or like you said, you could pair like a Hideki and DeChambeau or DeChambeau and Shoffley, or even go down to you know Sungjae and Scott and get that. I think some of these players in this mid 8K range, low 9K range, are going to be a little bit under owned because of that, because there is a lot of players, and we'll talk about them here in that 7K range and below. So I think a balanced approach might be a little bit contrarian this week. Um, so another player that I'm looking at who, you know, all the players that we mentioned is Tony Finau. He hasn't played here since 2017. He's T28. He's made the cut here all three times. He's got better each and every time. He's coming in with a little bit of form. He let people down the T51 in his last event, but he, you know, he's shown that upside, um, top five upside. And at that, that price, we don't need a win so much out of Finau, but like a top five, top 10, is definitely in the cards, you know, provided that he doesn't like par the whole course, but there's definitely going to be some birdies in there. He just, he fits my model. Um, and I think he's going to be a little bit lower owned. He's 12th in strokes gained approach, 12th in par four scoring, 12th in uh, longer 450 plus yard par fours, uh, top 30 in bogey avoidance. He's outside the top 30 in birdie or better percentage and long irons, uh, 200 plus yards, but still inside the top 50 in this field. I'm definitely going to be on Tony Finau at 8,900 this week, thinking that he's possible. I'll use him in all formats. I'm thinking that's maybe a way I'm going to go is balanced for cash and stay away from that Stars and Scrubs. And Sung Jay, Finau, somewhere in that range is going to be where I'm going to start my cash game lineups this week in that uh, 8, 9K range. 
So with uh, that, one guy I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, was Henrik Stenson. Um, yes. The history here, I don't I don't know about ownership. Maybe he he gets a little bit owned. Um, it's obviously I think this is the same every year, but it's his first tournament over here in in the states. Um, obviously, you you know why this course suits him. He's a great iron player, great long iron player. It's the best three wood in the game. A whole lot this year. Uh, 44th in Saudi Arabia, 37th in Dubai. Um, and the final round is what killed him both both events there. Um, so what's, what's your thoughts on him? I, I, I kind of like him for GPPs as, as long as he doesn't get out of control on, and I don't think he will at 8,800. No. I The ownership's definitely going to come from that uh, course history. I do like it. Yeah. One thing that kind of scared me off right away was the form. Um, T44, T37, and two events at the Saudi and the Omega Dubai Desert Classic. But you go back. He won the Hero Challenge, uh, 23rd at Singapore yeah. as well. I went back and looked at last year when he came in. Uh, I think he finished T17 here last year. Uh, he came in last year without form whatsoever. He had missed three straight cuts, yeah. followed by a T54 at the Mexico, and then popped for a T17 here um, and then missed a cut the next week at the players. Like he just, some of these guys, I'm not going to say, I love course history. Course history doesn't work for some players. Course history works for some players. Um, it's just, it feels like more of a comfortability thing where he comes over here. It doesn't matter what form he's in. He's comfortable with the course, whether he loves the area, he loves the greens, the grass. He's really good with his three wood. It's a course that fits him. It just, it all falls into place for him. I don't think I can trust it for cash games. Um, I do have him labeled as a GPP play just because that upside of a top five and a win here is definitely in play. And I'm not worried about his form whatsoever just because he's proven in the past he can come in with terrible form and still show up at this tournament. I think last year there was one round that really got him where he probably would have been with another top five. Like he's finished top 10 in five of his last seven and one missed cut and a T17 in that time. So, I mean... He's been incredible here, so I'm definitely going to be on him in GPPs. He's one I'm definitely going to pay attention to come Wednesday when we start breaking down maybe some ownership projections, especially in that 8K, 9K range. That's where I'm most interested in seeing on Wednesday where things are going to kind of fall and where things are going to be projected. Yeah, with, yeah so with that, um, we'll just jump down. We have went through the 8, 9, 10K range. In the 7K range, my favorite play, one of my favorite plays of the week, and I think he might come low on because he missed the cut here last year, is Abraham Answer. He's number 13 in my overall model on my sheet. Yeah, fin- missed the cut here last year. He was 107, so he didn't just miss it by a little bit. He really didn't have a great week. He's coming in with some incredible form as well. He's making a lot of cuts. He's got uh, top 10s in three of his last five, coming off a T12 in his last event. He's scoring in terms of DraftKings. Looking at some of the stats, you know, ball striking, he's top 25 in ball striking in this field. He's a good putter. He's top 35 in uh, strokes gained putting. I believe if I look at it here, he has been good. Of course, I can't find that at the moment. Yeah, uh, bogey avoidance. He's third in bogey avoidance since the start of the year in this field. Seventh in birdie or better percentage. So whenever I see a player top 10 in both of those stats, making birdies and avoiding bogeys, really pops off the page to me. He's definitely a guy that I would consider as a cash game play for sure and a GPP play because, like I said, he missed the cut here last year. A lot of people, I think, may see that um, with other guys in this range, whether they're going up into the 8K or down, like you said, stars and scrubs-wise. This could be another guy that fits in the middle of the stars and scrubs that could be um, a lot lower owned this week. So he's definitely number one for me. And then moving down a little bit in the 7K range, there's two guys I really, really love here. Uh, Maverick McNeely's top 10 in my model. He's had excellent form um, as well, making cuts. He actually played here back in 2016. Made the cut T46, which is pretty darn good for a young guy. Top 15s in four of his last five coming into this event. And he's made cuts, like I believe it's 10 straight now. So I in that range, he's scored on average more DraftKings points per event this season than anyone else below him in price so that's one thing that stood out to me he's someone i'll consider in all formats as well and then the other one i'm i I don't want to use him in gpp i just don't see the upside but you can't argue with uh the floor that he provides is ian poulter 
He, he's 90 to 1. He's only 7,600. He's made the cut here every year, going all the way back to 2011 with top 25s in five of those, six of those, sorry. He's coming in with decent form, top 30s in three of his last four, a withdraw in one of those as well. So he would be the third guy in this kind of low 7 to high 7K range that I'm looking at. How about yourself? Looks like Dane muted us again. Oh, there. See? Ah! <laughs> I, I love it. stop using that thing. That is not every week I do it. All right. <laughs> anyway, my, my favorite guy up in the mid to upper 7K range is Maverick McNeely. Like, uh, He's too cheap. I'm in line with you there. I like that he played here in 2016. Yeah, for sure. I like that he played here in 2016 at age 20, made the cut. Um, all around game has been there, um, and he's trending really well um, in my stat model, in the rolling stat model. Um, next up for me at 7,600 is Rafa Cabrera Veo. Uh, he's third here last year. He looks to be getting the form together a little bit since he's came over. Uh, the course suits him to a T with his ball striking, um, and when he's on, it's just he's unconscious with that. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's the two I like in the mid to upper 7K range, and. I'm really starting to fall in love with some of these lower guys, and uh, that's kind of why I'm leaning towards a Stars and Scrubs type build this week. Yeah, I'll let you lead off that range. We'll just start right in that kind of low 7K and, and all the way down into the, I believe we go down to what this week? We got 6K is the lowest, so I'll let you lead off with a few guys you like in that range. Yeah, so I don't know if I would I rank these guys. The, the three guys I have are – almost identical uh, for me. Um, first off, Harold Varner, 7,100. That's too cheap for him. I feel like last 12 rounds in recent form, he's fifth in my stat model. He's uh, really getting things together, tee to green. Um, couldn't get a putt to fall last week. And, and this course should fit his game. A um, little bit wider fairways. Maybe he can um, keep it in play and, and attack the greens. Uh, next is Carlos Ortiz, 12th in my overall uh, model this week. Been trending very well. Again, T to green. Um, he's 21st and 29th in two trips here. That's nice to see. He's been really steady over the last uh, little bit, and 7,100 is another good price. And then dipping down into the 6K range, my favorite is, is Matthew Neesmith. All over him last week, and, and he's 10th in my model again this week. Um, gained six strokes on approach last week at the Honda. It was similar conditions to what we're going to see this week. Uh, fairly tough, windy, um, most all the week, and he played really well throughout the week. So Matthew Neesmith is my favorite in the 6K range. That's awesome. I agree with you with Neesmith. He just – that at 6,800, even 8K on FanDuel just seems way too cheap for how well he's been ball striking lately, making cuts. Not just making cuts, but he hasn't finished outside the top – he hasn't finished – top 40 or worse um, in it looks like about seven straight events here with four top 20s in that time as well. So he's just been super solid. I agree with you on Ortiz as well. He's got the course history. Nice to see with that course history, both top 30s were four years apart as well. He didn't play for three years at this event, showed back up and got a top 30. So I like seeing that, especially with he's got form as well. Um, Taylor Gooch stands out in my model as well. He finished T26 here back in 2018. He's coming in. He's been making cuts. He does. He did flash with a top 10 um, and a T17 five, five events ago, but mainly he's been making cuts, so he stands out for me. And then Sebastian Munoz is another one, 6,900. His ball striking off the tee hasn't been great, but obviously I'm, I'm leaning a lot more on approach this week. He gained 6.9 strokes at the WGC Mexico, 2.2 at the Genesis the week before that, 0.6 at the Waste Management. He missed the cut at the Farmers, was a little bit off there. All His whole game was off. He lost 7.5 strokes total that week. But before that, at the American Express, he gained 5.1 strokes approach. So he's gaining a lot of strokes on the approach lately. He's been putting very well in his last two, gaining almost two strokes in both of those events, the WGC Mexico and the Genesis. So at his price, I see some upside there for him. Um, he This is his first time here as well. So there's a little bit of risk there. But when we get down in this range and we're talking stars and scrubs, it's mainly for 
it's mainly for GPPs, so we can take that little bit of a risk. And in terms of, you know, we've got a smaller field here this week as well. So, I mean, we're narrowing it down there. But definitely my number one in this range, and I would even consider him in cash games, is Matthew Naismith. So that's another reason. If you want to go a little bit higher up with a start of a cash game build, you can go Bryson or Sungjae. Like, I'm not, I'm totally fine starting my cash lineup with Sungjae this week at 9,500, mixing them in with, like, say, a Tony Finau, um, Tyrrell Hatton. Um, we also talked about uh, Answer. You mentioned Cabrera Bayo, Ian Poulter. Those are all guys I find to be safe floors and I will use in cash games. None of them I'll look really to, like I said, Ian Poulter's probably going to be cash only for me. Uh, JT Poston as well. If that's how you say it, not 100%, post and post on. But there are a lot of guys down in this low range who offer a, a floor. Naismith is one of them. Um, Taylor Gooch possibly is another one I would consider. Carlos Ortiz is one I would consider for cash. Outside of that, Varner's GPP only for me. Dude can make birdies in bunches. I absolutely love that at that range. Um, Munoz, like I said, he's probably going to be GPP only. Sung Kang stands out a little bit as well. He finished T6 here last year. He's been really up and down with the form. In terms of a boomer bust play, he's definitely on the radar for boomer bust plays. He'll either miss the cut by five strokes or he'll make the cut and just put up birdie after birdie after birdie. He's done that here. He did it here last year. He's done that this season. He's missed a cut, followed it up with like a T14, uh, missed a cut, followed it up with like a top 20. And in those top 20, he's the type of player that can outperform his finishing position with DraftKings scoring. So that's something I really look at too. Actually working on a sheet, looking at... Looking at DraftKings results versus finishing position results just to kind of see a plus minus of if a guy outperformed his finishing position because there are guys and there are a lot of tournaments that you'll see a guy finishes maybe top, let's say T22 to T25 somewhere in there. He outscores a guy that finishes T15 to T20 just because he's made more bogeys but we get most of our scoring from birdies so maybe he's made five, six more birdies for the tournament. Um, that can definitely make up for those finishing position points of, you know, five or ten spots. So that's something I look at for GPP, and Sung Kang's definitely one that stood out there. Last question for you. Is there anyone, like, if you were to go, say, 6,500 and below, like, scraping the bottom of the barrel here, is there anyone that stands out? One that, if you want to go super GPP, he's going to be 1% owned, Kevin Chappell. Um, He's got top tens. It's like every year he's alternated here. So going back to 2012, he's got T24, missed cut, T14, missed cut, T2, T49, T7. So he's done well here. The form is absolute trash. Um, He does have a top 25 two events ago. But he would be like a superstars and scrubs. Like if I'm trying to jam McElroy and Matsuyama or DeChambeau and Matsuyama or whatever, two of those top 10K guys in a lineup, I might consider going to him, but it's going to be super contrarian. I'm going to have, if I do 50 lineups, I would have him in maybe two or three max. But he's one I'll definitely look at. Yeah, I guess probably the only guy I would go to down there is Doc Redman. Uh, been on him a lot, but um, he he's the definition of boomer bust. <laughs> yep. Probably awesome. for me. Uh, he, he does rate out decent in uh, stat model, but uh, and he did make the cut, I think, in his only – he was dead last of people that made the cut, but he yeah. did make the cut in his only appearance here. So he's probably the only guy I would go down to that far it, down. Yeah, he kind of fits in the same, like you said, boomer bust. So I'm looking at him kind of the same way mm-hmm. I look at uh, Sung King. Um, they can definitely go off and put up birdies in bunches. He showed us here last weekend. He, like, he rose – up the leaderboard like crazy. I think that was Saturday afternoon. Maybe that was Friday on cut day. But he went really low, um, but then just kind of fell off. He can put together a lot of those bogeys or worse as well. So those are a couple guys that fit in that boomer bust category, especially this week if you're trying to go stars and scrubs. Those guys can definitely work. Um, they're probably going to be, you know, two percent, one percent owned. So if they end up getting a top twenty um, or even just top twenty in scoring in terms of DraftKings or FanDuel scoring, they can definitely help pay off if you get like your Rory McIlroy to run away with the tournament or something like that. And you've got a couple of these seven K and below guys that get just top twenties, top fifteens to top twenty, top twenty five finishes. That uh, definitely helps out. So. 
So that kind of covers everything. We went through all the ranges, talked about a few players that we like each, talked about some strategy. We talked about uh, the course itself. If you've got any questions, make sure to get over to rotopros.com. If you're not a member, hit that sign up button in the top right hand corner. Gets you a free trial, gets you into our Slack chat, um, access the Slack chat. In the Slack chat, you're going to have access to um, DFS PGA cheat sheet for the full tournament as well as round one through four showdown sheet. Those have highlighted plays for cash games, GPPs, value plays, uh, as well as each and every round for showdown. Dane and I are there for uh, analysis for showdown, like looking at ball striking versus putting. Those are some of the trends that we really look at from a day-to-day basis. Guys who are ball striking, very good tee to green, but maybe missing some putts or putting below their long-term averages. That's something I've really started breaking down. So that's something that you get in that Slack chat. So get over there, sign up, get in, see what we're all about. Um, definitely give us all your feedback. We'll definitely adjust this show to fit exactly what you guys are looking for each and every week. Um, so thanks for joining us. Like I said, we've got the Arnold Palmer Invitational Thursday morning, very early lock. So Wednesday night, we're going to be around and chat, uh, answering all your questions. Thanks for joining me again, Dane. Glad to be back here. Um, the video, um, you can check it out on YouTube. You can uh, leave your comments, questions below, as well as we will be posting on SoundCloud the audio version of this. So if you just want to listen and not listen or not watch the video and, and see our beautiful faces. I don't know why you'd want to miss that. But if you do, <laughs> we will have the audio version only for you. So thanks for joining me, and let's get yeah, some green one, screens one this week. One thing I want to mention, yeah, one yeah, thing I want to mention is uh, I'm glad I got through an entire podcast slash <laughs> video without mentioning Victor Hovland. <laughs> oh, my, I was, you know what? I made a note before we started um, <laughs> asking you about Victor Hovland. I asked him, I guess, about last week. I kind of... Uh, brought it up there, but yeah, I was going to yeah. ask you about him. He's going to be super low owned. Might get him, but uh, I don't think it's Victor Hovland Lake this weekend. I think he's still partying from uh, that win in Puerto Rico. <laughs> but awesome, everybody! Yeah. <laughs> Let's have another good week, and we'll see you in chat. Have a good night. Yep. Good luck, everybody. <laughs>